I'm here with Joe McDonald, who's been fighting in the Ukraine against the Russian invasion for about seven months. And uh, he's back in Britain. And you've, you've had quite a bit of experience now encountering the way things are done in Ukraine and the way things that the, the old Soviet regime perhaps does things. Um, you say that the, the Ukrainian army seemed a bit officer heavy. Yeah, um, like I, I first want to caveat this by yes. by saying that I have got an, an immense amount of, especially after the Kharkiv counteroffensive, I have got an immense amount of respect for the Ukrainian army, mm -hmm. from the normal soldier right the way up to high command, because clearly, based on how well that counteroffensive went mm -hmm. and hitting all their ammo dumps beforehand, they really are very organised and good at manoeuvring large numbers of troops without anyone knowing and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. However, ah. but, you know, as they say, um, what happened in, when the Russians invaded was that immediately Ukraine declared full mobilisation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they've spent the last eight years trying to decommunise the army. And this is a process. You can't do it overnight. Mm -hmm. And they still uh, have some kind of hangovers from the Soviet days, which is an, uh, most noticeably a very officer-heavy uh, command uh, structure. Right. So in the British Army, for instance, with my limited TA experience, mm -hmm. um, basically everything... Like, officers would very rarely speak to me as mm -hmm. a recruit. There was no need to. They'd perhaps address all of us on parade from time to time, but an officer actually saying to you, UK, you're going to go here at this time and you're going to dig this trench or whatever, that is, that's an NCO's job. It's a corporal's job or a sergeant's job. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Ukrainian army, I mean, a, a ma an, another example is majors. In the British army or the American army, a major is, is like a rare and exotic, exotic species of wildlife, mm -hmm. you know, and they're, they're seen from a distance and from afar. You know? Right. And if one is actually coming to your unit... Quick, whitewash everything. Yes. Whitewash, paint the grass, whitewash the walls, iron your uniform. What, you've ironed it already? Well, iron it again! You know? Those but you can't see your face in both of those, in all parts of those boots. Keep going. That's what it's like when a major visits. Whereas in the Ukrainian army, you'll find majors, like, eating a kebab and handing out cigarettes... On, on a Saturday, you mm -hmm. know, you'll you'll find majors like sat around the campfire with a bunch of sergeants smoking and joking. Mm. And obviously officers still get to command rank and hierarchy and stuff still works, but it's it's a very it's a very different system. Like a, a lieutenant in the sorry, British sorry, a what? A lieutenant, sorry. Oh, right. Been yes. around the Americans for too long, mm. and the French. Uh, but yeah, a, a, a lieutenant in the America in the in the Ukrainian army is almost a pretty much the same role as a lance jack does in right. the British army. Like lots of running around for other people, mm. and next to no thanks of it, you know. Um, and, and almost the uh, the sort of senior sergeant. The one exception they have that is. But some similarity to our system is a senior sergeant who will normally be for a, for a company. Mm -hmm. There'll be a, 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 the, the legion. There'd be a Ukrainian officer, and then he'll have his supply sergeant. And this guy is definitely more listenable to than say the couple of younger lieutenants and officers and stuff who are around. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh. And right. uh, so one of the other problems we, we saw with how this difference in command affects how the whole army treats each other is, is seeing how a, an army with no real NCO corps, mm. the officers, if they treat a, a lieutenant like a hard rung, a hard, you know, a not particular in the, particularly in the good books, Lance Jack in the British Army, you know, mm -hmm. they're always making them run around and do all the boring jobs. Like a lieutenant handing weapons in and out the armory for a bunch of recruits that's not an off it's not a lieutenant's job mm -hmm. it's not an officer's job a captain waiting around on the range to tell a bunch of recruits that they can start zeroing the rifles it's not a captain's job 
you know, a major coming along to do the same thing. It's like, why is a major even looking at recruits, mm. you know? That's like, the, you see them on the first day and they seem like a very jolly uncle and then you never see them again. And if you do, you're probably in trouble, you know? That's how senior officers are meant to work. But here, they, and, and we see, they treated us very well, mm -hmm. you know, or as well. They treated us very politely. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're honoured guests, we're foreign volunteers, we've come to fight for them and also we're a wonderful boon to PR, you mm -hmm. know. So they treated us very well. But we see how they treat the Ukrainian rankers and it's like, hmm, you know. And then uh, you see some of the, some of, most of the Ukrainian army are kind of up to date with what NATO tactics and stuff should be. Right. But sadly, a lot of the older guys... They seem to think that, you know, why, why, why bother with all this arrowhead and, and double column extended line kind of moving troops around a field when we can all just walk in one straight line? Mm. And they seem to think that was... And, 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 but there's another, there's the, the two Ukrainian sort of formations I've seen, mostly down to older bad officers like this in the field, are the single line that, you know... It's a line ahead, you mean? Line ahead, going right. like that or perhaps spread out in one big line. But normally, when the rounds start to land, mm. the extended line then comes together and forms what we call the Ukrainian blob formation. Ah. And uh, this target -rich is environment. a target-rich environment. Thankfully, Ivan, the Russians, are poor shots. Right. But... I have personally seen because we we thought uh, on part of the part of the counteroffensive when we were supporting this artillery unit, uh, one of the guys, one of the Ukrainians, shouted "fighters, fighters!" Now, what he actually meant was he'd seen some fighter planes in the far distance, right? Right. And we got bumped by one uh, the morning before. We'd woken up to being rocket strafed by a fighter plane. Okay, so you're uh, so you out know for that, that was it. But, but all the Ukrainians took this to mean. There's some infantry a kilometre or so away or in the next hedge. And we were meant to be protecting them. So immediately I'm trying to get our Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher out. That, you know, anything that's not an armoured vehicle, I can just bu -bu 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 drop 50 grenades on top of that in no time at all. Right. And no one needs to go running up there with the rifles. You know, We'll just wait for them to shoot and then we'll start shooting grenades at them and we'll win. Simple as that. But no, that's not what happened, because next thing, all the guys who were sort of meant to be operating uh, artillery, we were all just marching off down the road in a big fucking blob. And I managed to sort of get our guys like, no, no, don't follow them in a big blob. Bullets go through people, you know, and hit other people behind them. Let's like, go down here and we'll go through these woods and we'll move quicker than them and we'll try and, like, flank whoever might be ahead. Because uh -huh. I don't want to just get machined, machine gunned on a road. And um, then it turned out, fortunately, that there wasn't any Russians in the hedge to shoot us, and it was just a false alarm. But in that moment, I saw that, uh, that yeah, while these guys have been trained to file artillery guns, the, the in basic infantry training was obviously non-existent. Mm. And they were falling. the natural human instinct is to, to, to blob together. together you yeah. feel safer. Yes, you feel safer, but despite yeah, but the fact that, we, you know, we're, in the days of spears and swords and such like that... You were safer. You were, but in the days of artillery RPGs and, and artillery, guns. no, you are not safer yeah. at all. But this is not... To, this, it is, is an artillery unit we're supporting. You know, the, mm. the Ukrainians absolutely have some first-rate infantry units, but, you know, uh, casualties and stuff are still very high with them but that's what comes when you're a small country fighting a bigger country that's got lots right. of artillery you know you have to accept like us you want i remember you once talking about how the army of the future mm -hmm. uh like if, if in afghanistan you know if we take one casualty they pretty much stop the battle and uh that's kind of for if we end up fighting someone like russia uh the, then you know that's not what you can do and you're absolutely right if you get hit in the ukrainian army mm -hmm. it's self care None of your mates are going to come for you. It's down to you to get your tourniquet on. And if you can't get it on, you're going to die right there. And only when the firefight is won are we able to stop and help you. And that's the price of fighting a numerically and equipment superior force. And that's, that's it. Hmm. Um, my unit overall 
I mean, it's hard to say because so many people have left the Legion, mm-hmm. and and but like, if we if we put the number at say two hundred and fifty, two hundred and fifty for Bravo and Charlie, we must have taken uh, wounded and dead about sixty by right. now. So quite a chunk, twenty percent. Mm. Or Ukrainian units. Um, I don't. Uh, obviously, Ukrainian casualty figures on uh, disclosed, mm-hmm. but it's it's more than that. It's high. It's more in the middle. Mm. Um, I know some guys from Ukrainian special For- forces units who've uh, you know had a little message chat conversation with me, and it's like, yeah, what? How's it going? It's like pretty bad. Uh, mission was success, but very tough and it's like so we're consolidating now and consolidating means you you've taken so many casualties that your unit is basically defunct for the minute and you've got to wait for new guys to turn up and revert and like Mm. that guy went through a few operations like that you know 10 go out four come back again and again Mm. and again and that's what that war's actually like you know um that's it's it's yeah it's pretty it is it's the second world war with drones that's pretty much the level of conflict we've actually been fighting now normally when i interrupt one of my videos for an advert i try to uh, choose elements of the advert that are somehow suited to the subject matter of the video and uh, this has always been possible when talking about things like the great courses plus because the great courses plus has lectures on so many different topics um but uh, Do you know, sometimes uh, when you are studying one topic, um, it can be just so grim. And the the war in Ukraine is a bit of a grim topic. And sometimes your mind needs a rest, a change, really. You need to to study something else. It's nice to be able to just browse through a big website like Wondrium, which is what The Great Courses Plus is now called because it changed its name. You see, the old one was too old-fashioned. Frankly, it just didn't function properly in a modern society. People heard The Great Courses Plus and they thought... Courses? Courses? What's that? What does that mean? Is it go- I don't understand what courses means. And, and, and are, they, are they any good? And, and do you get anything more than them? The Great Courses Plus. It was just too confusing. Whereas when you hear Wondrium, instantly you know that it's a huge website with loads and loads of lecture courses by um, uh, lecturers from august universities around the world. And uh, they talk to you and lecture you on all sorts of topics. And there's bound to be something there you can, you can find to take your mind off the grimmer topics of the world. Um, and so, for instance, I, I just let my mind wander. And, oh, there's a new thing about dinosaurs. And I, everyone likes dinosaurs. I mean, they're just, just so amazing. They're just innately interesting, aren't they? And um, you know, there's no... Nobody can ever say oh, too soon about dinosaurs. You know, it was 65 million years ago they got wiped out. So, I, you know, I think we can, we can study it with a clean... Uh, the topic with a clean conscience. And I've always been interested in... Uh, uh, dinosaurs, though I admit not as much as my brother, who when he was about 10 had a, a t-shirt that said Chris the Dinosaur Freak on it. Uh, I had a t-shirt that said Nick the Kick. It was not as good. It was because I was once very good at football when I was about one. I mean, everyone thought that was going to be the new Pele. Well, that didn't happen. Anyway, dinosaurs. Um, so they have um, a lecture course there that's, that's quite new. It's called Rediscovering, uh, Rediscovery of the Age of Dinosaurs. I'm not entirely sure why they say rediscovery. I mean, no, nobody forgot that dinosaurs, there was an age of dinosaurs. But anyway, rediscovery. And it's interesting that there are still really big topics, uh, really big things about dinosaurs that we don't know. Uh, even though we know amazing detail in some areas, other things like, were they warm-blooded? It's still, that's, that's still a debate that hasn't been settled. Uh, were they warm-blooded? <laughs> um, and uh, I was particularly drawn to uh, the one on flying creatures, um, uh, partly because I've seen some amazing mock-ups of pterodactyl-like creatures, and you look at them and think, no way could something that big possibly fly. Now, granted, the smallest of them are about the size of sparrows, but the big ones, the big ones were just terrifyingly immense. And you think, no, no, that's a monster of fiction. Uh, like the, the, the quicks, hang on, the Quetzalcoatlus. Yes, that's it. Um, which was just, just death from above. It, it, it had a wingspan greater than a modern jet fighter. Um, 
it, its head was bigger than its body, and it, it, its jaws were, I can't, they were bigger than that, they were big, they were longer, and the huge teeth, um, so it must have been a carnivore, and quite a successful carnivore, because you've got, be, you got to eat an awful lot of things in order to be able to grow that big, and why, well, just think how much energy it would take to get a body that size into the air. These things, when they were on the ground, were about the height of a giraffe, which, I suppose I don't need to remind you, but here it comes anyway, they're very tall, giraffes, very tall. And this thing, so imagine living in a world where there are these things flying around that could just swoop down and, and, and kill really big things with their teeth. Um, and you, you, I mean, you puny humans, though, oh, yeah, you'd be in great danger from one of these things. Um, yikes, they had others with teeth like baleen, which presumably um, fed in by some sort of sieving motion. And there was really quite a big family of these things. And uh, interestingly, they're not uh, the ancestors of modern birds. If you look at the, the family of tree of, um, uh, of dinosaurs, there's a branch that goes into the pterodactyls and that lot. Uh, and there's a, a separate branch that eventually turns into uh, modern birds. Um, uh, but even so, you can still see that they, they, they share ancestry with all sorts of animals, including us, because the, the structure of the, the bones in the arms, in the wings, um, it's much the same. You've got a bat, for instance, you've got a modern bat, and its thumb uh, is, is, a, is a sort of hook there, and these four fingers in a bat are, are much longer and have big webbing, uh, webbed skin in between, and they become the, 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 the wings of the bat. Well, you've actually got the same bones in a pterodactyl. You've got that bone, and you've got that bone, and you've got these three digits here, which uh, remain on the outside, on the front of the wing, so they've got a little slight, uh, prehensile capability there with three digits. And then this uh, finger here, the, the ring finger equivalent to the human, is hugely extended and becomes the front leading edge of a really long wing, which I look at it and I think that must have been really vulnerable. They must have broken really quite easily, because, not least because uh, these were not thick, dense bones as, as land, heavy land mammals have, because these have to get up into the air. So like a modern bird's uh, bone, they, they uh, were quite um, light. Much of the, the inside was air. Um, so, uh, but it was obviously a design that worked because they, they were around for uh, many, many millions of years. Although they'd been flying insects for hundreds of millions of years before uh, these things got off the ground. Um, uh, but they must have been pretty darn successful. Uh, and anyway, just uh, this this world of these huge flying things. I remember once I was walking across some playing fields, big, open, flat playing fields, and there were two swans. And I think that the swan is their heaviest flying thing in the world today. Yes, condors have got bigger wingspans and so forth, but the, the body of a swan is like that. They're fat water birds, and so the, the, the body is roughly the equivalent of a human torso. And... Every time these two circling swans came round, they flew directly over me, missing me by, I don't know, 20 or 30 feet, something like that. So I wasn't in any real danger, but I felt as though I was in danger because I appreciated just how big this thing was. And they were going so fast because if you're big, you have to go, unless you're going to expend a huge amount of energy, swans are not known for hovering. You see, to, to get a swan to hover would take a huge amount of energy. So instead, they get airborne and then get you know, uh, get lift and, and buoyancy in the air just by virtue of speed. And so these things would go whoosh past me. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, if one of those things hit me, I would not be harmed. Oh, no, I would not be harmed. I would be dead, very thoroughly dead. That amount of weight going at that sort of speed would kill a human stone dead instantly. There'd be no coming back from that. So um, not that I imagine pterodactyls hunted by ramming, but if a really big flying thing did perhaps accidentally ram a t-rex that would be scratch one t-rex if you had to clean up after that your main tool would be well a mop frankly anyway i i, I seem to have got off the oh yes so anyway my sponsor so wondrium yes if you go to www.wondrium.com stroke lindy beige then you will find their details of an introductory offer and you can go onto the wondrium site you can wander around you could uh, find a course that interests you have a look at it watch a load of it and during that trial period it's all free so why don't you click the link in the description and give it a go my sponsor wondrium and so where did these old Soviet doctrine, um, 
th these officers who, who appear out of the woodwork um, with these old, outdated Soviet doctrines, where, where do they come from? Well, I mean, they were they, the, everyone in Ukraine used to have to be in the Russian military, in the USSR. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and some of them, um, yeah, you know, they possibly, even when the USSR ended and Ukraine's independent, it had a Russian puppet government. Mm -hmm. So they're not changing anything. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's like when the post office became consignia, much of a muchness, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, now that's an analogy I, I didn't predict. <laughs> didn't know where that one came from, but but nevertheless, I think right. it's a, I think it's about right. You know, it's okay. yeah. You might not be part of the USSR anymore, but you know, we're we're still in charge, yeah. And you'll be doing things our way, mm -hmm. and that's how it stayed until 2014. So all the guys who were technically in the military after that point are still 100% part of a Soviet framework with all the ineptness, dullard thinking, corruption, nepotism and general Soviet shitbaggery that came with it, you know? And that's the sad face of it. But I would again like to reinstate that this is a small percentage of the overall Ukrainian army. Mm. There are lots of guys who've come up in the last eight years who, you know, I know guys who were uh, a, a soldier in 2014, 2016, and they're like a captain now, mm. you know. Uh, one thing the Ukrainian uh, military does is it's 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 all right with, pr with battlefield promotions if someone's competent. And uh, that is actually, you know, it's not something the British Army would consider probably these days because of the nature of the conflicts. But I'll tell you what, if we get into it with the Russians, they better change on that. Because mm. if you've got a smart, it doesn't matter if he's got six years. If he's smart and he's organised and he's running around getting everything done, promote that man. You know? Yeah. doesn't matter if he's been on the course and knows all the, all the little fripperies. If he can do the job that's in front of him, make that guy in charge, you know? And that's mm. something they are actually pretty good at. Uh, now then, is it true that you caught a spy? We, uh, I was part of a group of people who were responsible for the capture of a spy. Yes, um, I'm going to have to be very careful about what I say here. Okay, uh, you don't have to use any names. But uh, we were at the, uh, we were at a base somewhere in Ukraine. Yes. And uh, more recruits had turned up, mm -hmm. and uh, one of them uh, was a Spaniard. Mm -hmm. um, he, there was something up with him. We were told not to take photos, right, of bloody anything. You're allowed a selfie when you're, like, in a field or in the forest with absolutely bugger all recognisable behind you, you know? Right. Not even a bloody phone line, you know? No, Nothing. It's just earth. Yeah. You're allowed that. Mm. But you're not allowed to post them on social media or anything. And he's just sort of going around taking photos. And a few people, oh, man, you know, you're not meant to take photos. Oh, yeah, I just for the memories, you know. Come to what was on his phone in a bit. Ah. Oh. So, the thing is, he was, again, one of these guys who seemed to think, uh, you know, real special forces, if you're speaking to them and they actually feel like disclosing something about themselves because they're getting on with you mm -hmm. or that they're trying to make you understand who they are and why you should listen, mm -hmm. they're either going to say, I was in what unit they were in, I was in the SAS, I was in the SBS, I was in the 81st Range uh, Herbal Pathfinders Division, whatever. Or they're going to say, I was a combat engineer. Because combat engineers know how to do everything. And that mm -hmm. explains why, you know, why you know so much without disclosing that you're ex-ever. If you're just like, oh, I was Special Forces, it's like, were you? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm Special Forces too. Oh. Mm. You know, and... Um, he was one of these guys who liked it. He had a lot of a lot of boast and a lot of mouth flap, but uh, you know, then you'd see him. He, he'd say something stupid. Oh, go! Oh, it's uh, seven six two, and it's like it's an AK seventy four. It's five four five, mate. Everyone knows that, yeah. You know, like mm. don't even. That's that's a Boy Scout level kind of thing. You should know that the one AK doesn't take the, to the two kinds of AK bullet. Basically, it's pretty mm -hmm. pretty basic. But he rubbed a lot of the guys up the wrong way. And in this time, we kept getting air raids and having to go to the forest and hide in a trench in the middle of the night, you know. Mm -hmm. And it was bloody cold. So we got sent on an air raid and it's like, oh, it's cold and it's drizzling a bit as well. And I was like, I said to one of the lads, do you want to go back to the tent and grab the ghillie stove? And we'll, um, we'll make a cup, we'll get some brews on because we could be out here for fucking hours. And he's like, 
I all right or go in a sec I just don't want to you know make sure the officers aren't there I'm like yeah sound good good lad knew I could trust Dell you know mm -hmm. not his real name but yeah so uh, he goes back to the tent and finds this Spanish guy in there going through our fucking bags and he's like oi and this guy does a runner and then Dell comes back to tell me, and then at that time, just as Dell's walking back, the air raid is over, we get all clear. So we're back in the tent, and Dell's like, Big Matt, come here. You've listened, that Spanish guy was just in the bags, and I was like, what was it? What, Do you know what he's doing? And he's like, I don't know. He was, but he was in our bags, and it looked like he'd just gone through um, one of the other labs who was on the end bunk. Mm. And it's like, and he's already unpopular, and we've had a lot of problems with thieving. And now he's done a runner, and the lad's like, let's go and find him. And I was like, whoa, 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 because basically I was pretty certain that some of my hungry young killers were going to go and knife this guy out in the woods. We were, People were very fed up of having their things stolen, you know? Death. It used to be a hanging offence in the military, stealing from a comrade's pack, you know? So the principle of having that guy murdered for theft is... That was fine with me, but I didn't need the paperwork and I didn't need to lose any of my good guys. Mm -hmm. So I was like, don't do that. Do not leave the tent. Wait here. And I went over to the uh, international command tent, not the Ukrainian officer's tent, mm -hmm. and said, this has happened. You need to go in and find this guy and arrest him now or you're going to have a corpse on your hands in the morning. And they went, all right, thanks for telling us, and went and arrested him. Found, I showed them roughly where I thought he'd be, and he was. Mm -hmm. And they found him and arrested him at, at gunpoint, you know. Right. And then he was placed under arrest, but not handcuffed. And, you know, he was pretty much told, stay on that bent in the command tent, mm -hmm. do not fucking move, you know. Mm -hmm. But he did. It was in the middle of the night, people had gone to sleep. And he, you know, perhaps someone was on fire watch, but they didn't notice him roll out of his bunk and crawl out the tent. Right. And he, to, to kind of describe it, like where the, the officer's tent was, there's a road at the back of it, and mm. then our tent was like 50 metres uh, to the left across this road. Now, the, uh, the, where he ended up was the actual Ukrainian officer's command tent. And he was found by one of the Ukrainian officers who'd gone up for a piss mm -hmm. and trod on him and he was under the table at the time, trying, like, basically with his hands on a laptop. So he, <laughs> he crawled into the officer's command tent and attempted to steal a computer that obviously would have had all of our details on right. and all kinds of military information and been discovered by an officer who just happened to wake up and need a piss at three in the morning or whatever it was. And then um, the officers uh, were very angry, and um, I believe they, uh, I believe they might have made him dig a hole uh, just to keep him warm in the, right. in the night, you okay. know, because well, it was very, you know, well, you've got to think of the welfare. For exactly, you know, there's a bit yeah. of exercise, keep the chap warm. Mm -hmm. And then he was, uh, they they were looking through his phone and found that he had photos of absolutely everyone, but individually, you know, just he's like that, and you know, and he'd made notes saying captain and lieutenant, da 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 na like he'd named notes on mm -hmm. his thing. And this was when they hacked his phone as well. This is, you know, the SBU, who's the, the Ukrainian MI5, National GCHQ. Some sort of intelligence. Oh, yeah. yeah. They came in and they had, we were told by command afterwards that, yes, he definitely uh, was a spy because mm -hmm. he'd been taking photos and he had a GPS coordinates of uh, where the ammo but dump was on the base and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, a spy. Not a KGB spy, just an opportunistic fucking idiot with a smartphone who decided to come and try and look. And unlike many, many devious criminal types, thought he was cleverer than everyone else. It's not, it doesn't sound very devious, to be honest. Well, you know, the, the, the uh. criminals believe themselves to be devious, but they keep getting caught and sent to prison. Right. You know? So he was that kind of guy, you know, not no KGB... You so know. you think that he was going to try to sell this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's been—he realised he's, he's, re he's realised he's been rumbled, so and, he, and he's been—you know—he's probably been on messenger to the FSB and been like, "If I join the Foreign Legion, I send you information. What are you offering?" And they've said, oh, "We'll offer you <laughs> ten million rubles <laughs> and a night with the best Russian porn stars, you know, or something like that." And he's mm. gone, "Yeah, all right." And then he realised that his number was up. 
because he's been caught thieving or he could have been planting a bloody GPS tracker right on our tent so the missile lands right on our bloody tent, you know, mm. or something like that. Um, and uh, he, he thought, well, I guess he thought, well, if I can steal an officer's computer and get out the base, which would have been pretty fucking easy, and then just, you know, be like lots of other people who were just in military uniform, like, yeah, yeah, I'm a foreign volunteer, but yeah, no, my wife's sick, I've got to leave. You know, they're never going to check that that's his laptop at the border. And then he could hand that over to the, I assume the Russians have still got an embassy in Poland or somewhere. Mm. And, you know, that's you. Either a payoff or a Makrov to the back of the head, depending on how they were feeling, you know. Uh, but the SBU uh, took him away. And uh, we were told he was prosecuted and he'll be in Ukrainian prison for basically ever. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the Spanish government have got any interest in helping this guy out, you know. If you play spy games, you're on your own. Right. And, uh, yeah, um, and they gave us the right to uh, call our parents because uh, we weren't allowed any phone calls at the time what, with all the missiles and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave us uh, 200 fags and a free bars of chocolate and a great big uh, sausage. Hey. And I remember eating that sausage and thinking, I have just sent a man to one of the bleakest fates imaginable, but I have a sausage. Well, yeah. And so. that's okay. I'm happy with this outcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. yeah, if you will be a spy, uh, you know, be aware that there are lots of people around you who are paying attention to the fact that you keep take, doing things with your phone and yes, stuff. Yes, you when can't you rely be. on everyone else being an idiot. No, you know. So he was spying for the, the Russians. Guess so, yeah. Um, and what, what opinion did you... See, you didn't actually meet any Russians no, to I never, talk to. I, I never spoke to a POW. I was never within... I don't think I've ever been within 500 metres of one. I've seen them mm. at further distances. I've seen them dead. Right. Um, I did see some prisoners getting taken away. Uh, mm -hmm. in Kharkiv, but, like, that was nothing to do with me. I was right. doing other work at okay, the time. Okay, so you know? everything you know about the Russians is inferred from indirect evidence. It's well, long-range yeah, I mean, observation. Or... Um, and, you know, I mean, I've seen how they shout, whereas, like, say, that, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if any of us showed ourselves, or if the Russians spotted anything, even a solitary soldier, even evidence that we'd been somewhere, mm -hmm. a vehicle parked in an odd place you know, not under a tree and exposed. They just start mortaring and shelling or firing grads at the whole bloody area. Mm -hmm. You know, they didn't mind wasting a, a hundred shells if they got one guy. And they certainly didn't give a fig about who else that affected. You mm -hmm. know, the U, the Ukrainian, uh, well, the, the, the want-to-be Russian citizens that they're supposedly liberating from under the fascist boot of the, the so-called fascist boot of the Ukrainians, you know. Mm. So they didn't care about killing those people, whereas we would see, you know, in this river, we're on, you know, it's a big, wide river, but we'd see a whole group, quite regularly, of military-age males with in pretty good physical condition, mm -hmm. with short haircuts, all right. and they'd all come down in a group of, like, you know, 10, 15, 20 guys, and they'd all be in shorts and T-shirts, and they'd all start having a swim in the river. And sometimes they'd be there, literally, and I'll have to do this for the camera, but, you know, okay. bur burring the bloody arses at us. Right. Because they know that unless we see uniform and a gun, unless we can confirm that uh -huh. they are, in fact, Russian combatants, then we can't kill them. And we can't shoot at them. And we don't, we don't want the whole Ukrainian army's ethos is we do not want to. Collateral damage is really bad for us because they're our guys, mm. you know. So there was an incredible amount of restraint shown by the ethos of command and by the individual U Ukrainian soldiers and volunteers on the ground. At n at just not opening up at every time you think that might be some Russian soldiers. Mm. Because you've still got your guys on the other side, you know, who are just living their ming. Whereas the Russians would absolutely pulverise everything they could. And in the village I was, there were civilian casualties of, of civilians we'd seen, mm -hmm. you know, uh, there was a little girl who used to wave at us. 120 millimetre mortar landed in a house. Turned her to, turned her to nothing you can bury. And that made us all very, very angry for a bit. There was mm. quite a lot of people who wanted to go on a raid 
whatever command said at that time. But uh, thankfully, and you know, hope sensibly, one of our own NCOs just sort of shot the boats. So so it could because it it already happened before. Um, right. That one guy had swam across. He went. He was a Christian. Went a little bit crazy. Always worry about the Christian ones. Okay. Uh, he swam across. Um, uh, I'm going to call him Flack, very close to his uh, mm. nickname, but Flack, uh, some could call him an idiot, some can call him the hero of the bloody legion. You're certainly keen. Uh, yeah, damn damn keen, damn right. keen. Um, but I, I, we were impressed with him, and then there was another couple of guys who I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. uh, one of my very experienced US Marine friends who was recently killed. Uh, he, he and, and another guy had crossed the river and done a little successful drone recce, but they wanted to prevent that happening again, because the problem is if any of us get captured, that's pretty much every position for 200 guys compromised, mm -hmm. you know. We'd have to do an awful lot of digging. Yeah, we'd have to go and dig a lot more holes, and no one wants to do that, you know. So best not to get captured. So uh, to prevent this from happening again, uh, he just took a submachine gun to the well, boats. He did M4, I think. Yeah. Okay. But it, yeah. Well. Just uh, just gave a couple of mags into the small boats, and then there was no no more chance that people were going to go on go on raids <laughs> anymore, or or secret behind the lines uh, recce missions and stuff. So yeah. Um, but yeah, the the Russians um, really don't seem to mind what they hit. Mm. You know, um, they they don't seem bothered about that at all. And when we got into their positions mm. on, on the counteroffensive, um, I don't want to appear like I'm racist against the Russians because I honestly didn't have any opinion on them all before this war. But they they live like pigs. I've been into a number of quarters that the Russians were, and it's like, you know, there's no need to shit in your living space. And if you do, because you're being shelled. Clean it up afterwards. Do it in a plastic bag, for God's sake. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and uh, they had lots of lots of ammo, mm -hmm. lots of things that we didn't have, like uh, tandem charges for the RPGs and 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 and, and uh, thermobaric uh, warheads for the RPGs. You know, bunker clearers. Mm -hmm. uh, Would have loved some of them. You know, and, and armor-piercing ammunition uh, for 545, 760 by 39, 760 by 52, you know, all of all of the rounds in armor-piercing. We could never get armor-piercing ammunition. Right. So they had all this stuff, but the rations were shit. The living quarters were in an absolute dire state, you mm -hmm. know, up filthy, like a bunch of junky student squatters had been living there, you know. Right. And, um, and, and terrible... Clothing and stuff, you know, like uniforms from the bloody 70s, you know, old canvas mag pouches and some stuff like that. And, you know, like loads, new guns, fancy ammo, mortar rounds out, out the arse, you know, like million, mm -hmm. more, more stuff that goes bang and pop than you know what to do with. But everything else, pretty terrible, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, you see the size of the, uh, the Russian ration pack to the Ukrainian ration pack, you get about 50% less food in the Russian one. Yikes. You know? Right. Whereas the Ukrainian one, you get uh, two soup, you get three meals and a soup. Mm -hmm. So you get three kind of porridgey meats, not just oat porridge or the kinds, buckwheat and stuff, you know, or, or rice or even potatoes. You get a kind of a mashed thing with some meat in it three times and a soup. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's good, hearty grandmother's cooking kind of stuff. Plenty of fat in it, you know. <laughs> and um, which is good in cold weather. And, yeah, it's, and it, very it, typically Eastern well, European. Well, it's it's good. It's good in the middle of the summer when you're carrying around like twenty five kilos of weapons and equipment as a kind of minimum before mm. we even start putting a pack on, you know. So um, so yeah, uh, they they you can see that they don't really seem to you know they have this. You know, I think our military philosophy now is that a soldier should be fed so he can be an Adonis. Mm -hmm. And the Soviet one is a soldier should be fed so he's like a greyhound. Because oh. skinny equals quick. Okay. And, yeah, maybe not very resilient to physical work or digging or carrying a pack, but quick. And maybe narrower men are harder to shoot, perhaps. Perhaps that's the philosophy in basically malnourishing their entire bloody army. And that's why they do so much looting. You know, the, the mm. villages in Kharkiv were, we, they were, re when we came through on the tanks and stuff, they're like, just 
offering water sacks i've never eaten so much watermelon in our life they so much wanted to give us some of the mm -hmm. pickles and honey and produce and you know a few of the americans are like oh you don't want to take that and the ukrainians are just like we're not in iraq it's an old lady it's her honey from her garden it's fine mate mm -hmm. no, don't worry there's no ieds in the watermelon you know but they they really wanted to give us all this stuff all this food and then through interpreters and through some of the ukrainians you know, we're trying to get. I was. I gave out quite a lot of money on the counter offensive because these poor buggers haven't been able to earn any cash in six months. You know, mm -hmm. so just giving them the equivalent of fifty quid or something that is quite a bit of money in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. There's enough to, for them to get the bus into Kharkiv, or see the relatives, get some shopping in, put credit on the phone, whatever they need to do. You know, mm -hmm. and um, they really didn't want to take it. They wanted to give this food. And they didn't want anything for it, despite the fact that abjectly poor and have been under military occupation uh -huh. for six months, you know. And um, they, they said to the, the Ukrainian villagers said to us through the interpreters that the only things the Russians had paid for was vodka. Everything oh. else they stole. Never piss off the man with a still, basically. Okay. <laughs> but uh, they'd pay for vodka. Everything else they'd just take, you know. And um, occasionally their officers had come by if someone had been really out of order and they'd maybe, you know, give them a few rubles. But, well, you know, what, you know, there's nothing in the shops because your soldiers have looted it already, you know what I mean? So, mm. so yeah, these, these poor guys were living off uh, the Ukrainian tradition of, of pickling and jarring absolutely bloody everything you can in the summer. Right. And living off that. And it's lucky they did, because would have yeah, the Russians weren't helping them out with rations and humanitarian aid. And you were telling me it got to the point that you had you had an embarrassment of riches such that it was actually difficult to get at your weapons. Yeah, I mean we had so much food in, in the back of the van, it was like, you know, we're trying to like, you know, oi, oi, put the lid back on that honey, and you can see it's like balanced on top of an open tin full of grenade machine gun ammo, and it's like look Jesus guys, you know, and like Water, watermelons mixed in with the RPG rounds and stuff like that. But we uh, we did manage to, you know, 30, 30, 40 guys on the move will go through all of that pretty quickly, you know. Um, and there's always, yeah, if, if you haven't got anything to do, eat. And, and, if you've, and if you think you've got the time, sleep, you know. Right. So we got, we got through it all very quickly. There was this garlic and chilli conserve we got given. I think I'll remember the taste of that for the rest of my life. Really good. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. But not as good as the sausage, right? No, not quite as good as the spy catching a spy sausage, but uh, <laughs> but pretty good, you know. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Okay, no worries.